Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll continue now with our reading and discussion of this most revealing book, The Global Vatican. You hear talk about a new world order and a global government, a global religion, a global social, and a global economic system. The, Vat- the, the title of this book tells it all, The Global Vatican. Very revealing title. And we take it from the reading of this book that the papacy, once again, having received a mortal wound during the Protestant Reformation, has healed that wound and is now once again in control of the governments of the world. And to prove that point, we'll reread the last paragraph that we concluded with yesterday, and I'll make some comments about it. We're fo- if you're following along in the middle of the page 191, the uh, second full paragraph on the page 191, it says, among his other, con- uh, other concerns about Islam, Cardinal Turan, like others in the Holy See, lamented the lack of quote-unquote reciprocity, a precondition for real dialogue and understanding. What is that reciprocity? Listen here. Listen to what it says. Why should it be that Western countries, that is predominantly Roman Catholic countries, those that claim under the Western uh, Roman Empire, as opposed to the Eastern Roman Empire, that is what is known today as the Christian world, the Western Empire, headed up by Rome, why should it be that the Western countries and cities, including Rome, welcome mosques and institutions of all faiths, while Christian churches are prohibited or severely limited in many Muslim countries? In the, in the Vatican's own backyards, the Saudis had contributed tens of millions of dollars to build in Rome the largest mosque in Western Europe. As we informed the State Department, quote, the Vatican is demanding greater protection for Christians and greater freedom for religious expression, unquote. This description of the new Vatican tone turned out to be an accurate indication of where Pope Benedict XVI was headed. Where are they headed? To mix all religions. Right now as it stands, predominantly the East is Muslim non-Christian religions, let's just put it that way, in the West are predominantly Christian nations. That divides the world in half. Now the Pope being the great uniter, the great peacemaker, thinks the solution is to amalgamate all religions. That all religions be equally represented in every nation. Kind of sort of like mixing it up. You know, mixing up everything so that Christians have to live in the very shadow of Muslims, and vice versa. And so those who hold tenaciously to a given faith, let's take, for example, biblical Christianity, they are forced now to live not in a biblical Christian country, but one that accepts all religions on equal footing. And being faced with next-door neighbors who may be Islamic or every, any other religion, it places true Bible Christianity in a minority status. And opposing voices are, well, if you're faced with your enemy or your spiritual enemy or someone who believes differently than you do, then you have a choice to make. You either... Defend your religion or live and let live. And the, the mantra for the New World Order is, and this is the driving force behind the amalgamation of the religions over, over the whole world, is that in order to have, first, the papacy demands that everyone recognize that no matter what religion, what tradition, is held by these various religions, they all worship the same God. Just by 
different names and different traditions. That really, really, we're all of just one single faith. We all believe in quote unquote God, but we just worship him by different names and different traditions. And therefore, instead of allowing the world to be segregated, the Eastern religions from the Western religions, and then a, 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 a clash of civilizations leading to war and difficulty, that all religions must be thrust together. And then the Pope appoint himself the spiritual re leader of the world, while in the same time, the papacy is gathering up the power of the, of the civil governments to impose his will on the people, thus making everyone Catholic, whether they know it or not. That's my assessment of it. Yours might be different, but I want you to take away from this discussion one very important fact that's obvious from this paragraph alone. The papacy wishes to be the spiritual leader of all the religions of the world. Therefore, Roman Catholicism cannot be a Christian religion. And certainly we must understand that if the Pope claims himself to be the vicar or the replacement of Christ on earth, he's a counterfeit. Roman Catholicism worships the creation more than the creator and places all the emphasis, all the power and authority and, and pomp and circumstances, literally making the Pope a god over the whole world. And uh, it's it, by no means could it be described as Christianity. A global monarch, that's what the papacy is preparing itself to assume in the world, a global monarch. And that's why the title of this book is The Global Vatican. I, I wonder if the author of this book actually intended to reveal everything that he revealed. Certainly one thing is for sure, of all the things that he has revealed in this book, which we've asserted here on Inquisition Update for years, all of the things that he's revealed in this book could, <clears throat> could only be pro appropriate at a time when the world was ready to receive it. And that very fact alone should at least give you reason for, for pause that a book like this could not be printed and published in this country unless it was ready to be received by the people and it literally tells us where we are in the prophetic reality of the Bible the world is prepared for a global apostasy against God a unification of all the world's religions in a global rebellion against the true and only God and it's led by the papacy now, something else I want you to take from this discussion is that when you see in your neighborhood or your city or your state or your country a Muslim mosque being erected, you have to know that the Vatican supports this. It's the Vatican that wishes to amalgamate all religions and mix them up so that their one isn't separated in the East while the other is separated in the West causing a global division. The papacy wants unity and the amalgamation of all the religions is the method by which he chooses to unite all the religions and to claim himself to be the spiritual and temporal ruler over all. So when you see a mosque or a, a pagan religion building a, 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 a an institution for religious worship in this country that was originally Protestant, you must know the papacy is leading that effort. Okay? And ask yourself the question, is this the will of God? Is this what Christ wants? The answer is clearly no. This cannot be a Christian religion. And that our government supports this amalgamation 
of, of the world's religions and opens the borders for Muslims and Roman Catholics to come flooding into this once Protestant land, you know the target of all of this effort is to destroy the Protestant faith. That very faith that once put the papacy in a pine box. I hope I make myself clear. I hope I'm un being understood this morning. Sometimes I find it difficult to, to express myself in such a way that everyone can understand. But I think I've described it in, in, in simple enough terms so as not to confuse people. The papacy is behind this global ecumenical movement. That's another way of saying it. Ecumenism simply means the unification of all the world's religions under one theocrat theocratic head. That's the Pope. All right. Now we'll continue where we left off yesterday. The last, uh, the last section there on page 190, 191, he says, One final conversation stands out from that time. In early June of 2006, I was invited to a small luncheon hosted by Francis Campbell, the British ambassador to the Holy See. I also, atten uh, also attending were British Prime Minister Tony Blair and several church leaders. Now, well, my listeners should know that Tony Blair... Uh, his wife was Catholic, and he has since converted to Roman Catholicism as well, and I suggest that Tony Blair was Catholic his entire term in service in England. Anyway, it says, when the conversation turned to the subject of Iraq, the Prime Minister asked me a question that had clearly been troubling him. Quote, why is it that Muslims in the United States are so much less confrontational than Muslims in Europe? Unquote. My response, that is the response of Francis Rooney, the ambassador to the Holy See from the United States, my response echoed the words of Pope Benedict, Benedict XVI had said to me the day of my credentialing. The United States has the First Amendment, which has bred religious pluralism and blessed us with a unique and extraordinary tradition of assimilating peoples and cultures. There you have it. Assimilating peoples and cultures. Mixing it up. Taking that division between the Muslim East and the Christian West <clears throat> and mixing them all up. Assimilating them. Peoples and cultures. And intrinsic in this is religions. Okay? This is the very purpose of the papacy to assimilate all peoples. That's, that's literally the undoing of what God did at the Tower of Babel, where he separated the nations by confounding their languages. <clears throat> the, the, the papacy, with the cooperation of the kings and the governments of the earth, are assimilating peoples and cultures to break down religious fundamentalism. You're going to be okay in the New World Order if you accept every other religion as equivalent to your own. That the gods that are worshipped in these other religions are the same god that you worship in the, with the reading of the Bible. That's what the assimilation of peoples and cultures and religions is, attend is intended to do. And therefore, since Christ cannot be the head of such an eclectic mix of every pagan religion together with the true, then the Pope will gladly sit in his place. That's what the, the title, Vicar of Christ, means. To sit in Christ's place. You see how crafty they are? That's what they're doing right in front of our eyes. They're even admitting it. And the Pope uses the First Amendment of the Constitution as the example, the, the standard that should be set for the rest of the world. The First Amendment of the Constitution. 
that's the shining example for the whole world. That justifies the global ecumenical movement. Freedom of religion. And I ask the obvious question one more time. Is there freedom of religion in the kingdom of heaven? Will Christ share his throne with innumerable gods and goddesses? That's not at all what's taught in the Bible. The New World Order is an antichrist order. It is a papal order. And it is supported by the most powerful institutions in this world. First of all, the Roman Catholic Church, and then the kings and governments of the earth. All right, that concludes chapter 13. We'll move on now to chapter 14. It's entitled Regensburg. We're talking about the pontificate of Pope Benedict the 16th who reigned during the ambassadorship of Francis Rooney. This chapter begins with two quotes. The first one from Samuel P. Huntington, quoted from 1993. Quote, The clash of civilizations will dominate global politics. The fault lines between civilizations will be the battle lines of the future. Now a quote from the current Antichrist of the time, Pope Benedict XVI. This was taken in 2008. Listen carefully what he says. The world needs God. We need God. But what God do we need? That quote from the current Antichrist of the time, the ecumenical Pope Benedict XVI. The text begins, Summers usually pass quietly around the Vatican. Tourists fill St. Peter's Square and the Sistine Chapel, but the papal household vacates the apostolic palace for the cooler climes of Castle Gandolfo, a palace in the Alban Hills south of Rome where popes have summered since the 17th century. Summer 2006, however, was not without disruptions and diplomatic challenges for the Holy See. In mid-July, a war broke out in Lebanon after Hezbollah staged an ambush on Israeli troops in northern Israel. Israel retaliated with forceful attacks on Hezbollah targets in southern Lebanon, first airstrikes and rockets, then ground troops. Hezbollah responded by sending a barrage of rockets into Israel, killing dozens of civilians. The Israel-Hezbollah conflict caused great concern in the Vatican. The church condemned Hezbollah's attack, but also blamed Israel for its reprisal which is considered disproportionate and dangerous to civilians. By the tenets of Catholic Bellum Ayustum, or the just war theory, this is Thomas Aquinas' teaching, remember the, the demonic doctor of the Roman Catholic Church, Thomas Aquinas, the just war theory, De uh, self-defense is permitted, but it must not exceed the injury against which it is meant to defend. In other words, proportional retaliation, <clears throat> self-defense. Now, Cardinal Sedano, the Vatican Secretary of State, explained the Holy See's position on July 14th. Quote, In the past, the Holy See also condemns both the terrorist attacks on the one side and the military reprisals on the other. Indeed, a state's right to self-defense does not exempt it from respecting the norms of international law, especially as regards the protection of civil or civilian populations, unquote. <clears throat> Intrinsic in this, obviously, if you're carefully paying attention, is that international law is papal law, and all nations are bound to obey papal law. So the international law, or the papal law governing uh, relations between states, indicates that a nation can defend itself but cannot use more force than was used in the original offense. It must be proportional. Okay, this is international law, papal law, just as all other civil laws in the world are more and more and more taking on the character of Roman Catholic canon law. This is how the 
the papacy, with the cooperation of the kings of the earth, make us all subjects of the Roman pontiff. Now, central to the church's worries was the fact that Lebanon had a large Christian community, nearly 40% of the population, most of whom were Maronite Catholics. Despite its long history of violence, Lebanon provided a rare example of religious freedom and cooperation in the Middle East. Muslims and Christians lived happily together in relative harmony and shared power in coalition governments for years. The church worried, that is the Roman Catholic Church worried, that, sh that war would disrupt the status quo and urge the United States, right, the battle axe of the Pope, through our embassy to push Israel to agree to a ceasefire at the earliest date. For our part, we pressed the Vatican to encourage Patriarch Nasrallah, Pierre Safir, head of the Maronite Catholic Church in Lebanon, to unite with his fellow Christians in defiance of Hezbollah. Lebanese Christians, including Catholics, tended to exhibit their patriotism by supporting Hezbollah against Israel. But we had no doubt that Hezbollah was a dangerous element in Lebanon and would become more dangerous if Christians yielded to it. Pope Benedict addressed the, Leban the Lebanon conflict in his weekly public prayer, the Angelus, on July 30th, calling for both sides to immediately lay down arms and for the world to assist in achieving this as soon as possible. That is, for the kings of the earth to help achieve the peace, the papal peace, as early as possible. Quote, in God's name, I appeal to all those responsible for this spiral of violence in all sides to lay down their weapons immediately. I ask government leaders and international institutions to spare no efforts to obtain this necessary secession of hostilities and thus, through dialogue, be able to begin building the lasting and stable coexistence of all the Middle Eastern peoples, unquote. So, out of fear of repeating myself one more time, the papacy foments the discord, stands aloof as the peacemaker, and then gets the kings of the earth to Im implement the Pope's solution to the problem. Problem, reaction, solution. And the papacy is in, control, is in control of all three phases. The papacy control creates the problem through the Jesuit order. Reaction, he gauges the reaction and ma manages it, manipulates it by you know, a, a term that I've used here on Inquisition Update, framing the debate, framing the debate by stating the issue as the papacy wants the world to see it, and then offers the solution. Papacy causes the problem, frames the debate, and then offers the solution. And it's always, it always amounts, the solution always amounts to more control of the papacy over the governments of the world. Okay? A papal objective in every, from start to finish. All right, because and and it's important right now in the Middle East because the Pope has to fulfill his phony futurist seventieth week of Daniel. There's got to be an Israel with a temple and animal sacrifices, a seven-year peace treaty, and then in the midst of the treaty, he's going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Therefore, the world will identify that person as the Antichrist and then the papacy will be exonerated and then be free to represent himself as the vicar or the replacement of Christ on earth. That's the thesis here of Inquisition Update, and we state it frequently so it, we never lose sight of what the papacy's real intent is. The papacy is the Antichrist. We'll be back right after this.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support Inquisition Update to help keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. And if you'd like to contact me, please do so by email. My email address is tom at cwaves.us. Now, before I begin again the text of this book, I want to pose a scenario, a possible scenario to you. Understanding that the Pope, in order to fulfill his futurist interpretation of Daniel 9.27, thus rejecting that Jesus was the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease, and has convinced the world that it is the Antichrist that is going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, thus necessitating a modern nation state of Israel, thus necessitating that Jews live in the land, thus necessitating that a temple be built so that animal sacrifices can be performed, requiring a treaty to be signed over which the papacy will rule. The papacy is the greatest Zionist on the planet. See, the Pope, the Pope can't fulfill <clears throat> the futurist version of Daniel 9.27 unless all these things exist. And it was the papacy through the First and Second World Wars that made it all happen with the cooperation of the, of the governments of the world, particularly that of the United States of America. But what if, what if the Spirit of God through the truth descends upon Israel at this time? 
just at the time when Satan is going to perform the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. What if the Jews, having rejected Jesus Christ for 2,000 years, finally come to recognize that he was their Messiah? And all of Israel repents of having crucified the Lamb of God. What if all Israel repents in sackcloth and ashes and accepts their Jewish Messiah? What does that do to the greatest Zionist on the planet? What does that do to the papacy? What if the Jews all of a sudden tomorrow realized that it was Jesus who came to bear their sins on his own body and suffer their punishment, thus satisfying the justice of God on their behalf, and they truly repent? Where does that leave the Roman Catholic Church? Where does that leave the quote-unquote vicar of Christ? And where does that leave the modern nation state of Israel? You know what I see potentially on the horizon? A Jewish Protestant Reformation. What if the Jews all of a sudden, through revelation, realized that it was Jesus who came to set them free. And then they realized that it was the papacy who enslaved them and holds them captive even today, even in their ancient homeland. What if the Protestants having rejected the truth of historicism and the fact that Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease and like the, the apostate Jews today are looking for a future Christ and an antichrist and leaving the door open for the papacy to proclaim himself the vicar of Christ on earth what if the Jews now get it what if the Jews now get what the Protestants have forgotten I believe God is the God of miracles. And he may yet convert his Jewish brethren. And when he does, Rome better look out. Wonderful prospect. Would to God that it happens. But we're just going to have to wait and see. But I would like to stand in unison with Jewish Protestants in another Protestant Reformation and put that papacy back in its pine box once and for all. Now we'll continue the last full paragraph on page 194. In addition to his weekly Angelus, delivered from a balcony over the public square in front of Castle Gandolfo, the Pope thought and wrote a good deal that summer. He was composing a new book, A Life of Jesus, and preparing for a September journey to Germany. Benedict had been in the papacy for shortly over a year, and it was still too early to tell what legacy he intended to leave. His first major work as Pope, an encyclical issued at the start of the year, addressed love and charity. The encyclical's title, taken from the first epistle of St. John, was Deus Caritas Est. Deus Caritas Est, which means God is love. While Deus Caritas Est was consistent with church dogma, the Pope framed Christian truth as something positive to be embraced and celebrated rather than imposed. Okay? These are words contrary to the entire history of the papacy. Roman Catholicism, just as it is today, was always imposed upon the people. Roman Catholicism is being imposed upon the Protestants of this country through the civil law. 
Roman Catholic canon law is become the civil law of this country. Roman Catholicism is never uh, just offered. Roman Catholicism is always imposed. And it says, as with so many of his previous speeches and comments, the encyclical was issued in the context of the conflict between the Christian and increasingly secular West and the Muslim and increasingly fundamentalist East. Though he did not mention radical Islam, Pope Benedict was writing in a world where, as he put it, quote, the name of God is sometimes associated with vengeance or even a duty of hatred and violence, unquote. It's funny how he condemns the whole world for doing the same thing the Roman Catholic Church has done for 1,800 years. He says the key word he brought to the discussion was, quote-unquote, reason, which appears in the encyclical 20 times. Faith without reason leads to intolerance and violence. But reason without faith is no better, for faith is, quote, a purifying force, unquote, on reason. Quote, from God's standpoint, faith liberates reason from its blind spots and therefore helps it to be ever more fully itself. Faith enables reason to do its work more effectively and to see its proper object more clearly, unquote. Another way to understand this might be that reason not directed by the moral compass of faith, which to this author should mean Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism, can become a force for in, inhumanity and injustice. From the moment Benedict XVI took office, this view evolved consistently in his speeches and writings. It found its clearest and most dramatic articulation in September of 2006, when the Pope returned home to Germany. Now, I just want to make a brief interjection here. It was the papacy who always suggested that reason, using one's own reason, led to apostasy. In Roman Catholicism, one is not to reason within oneself, especially under the guidance of the Scriptures, because then you come to the truth, the Protestant truth. Okay, that's the apostasy. That's why Rome always condemned reason. Roman Catholics are not to understand the scriptures from their own understanding, but they are to understand the scriptures by the strict and sole direction of the priesthood. Okay, reason is the greatest enemy of the Roman Catholic Church. When you read the scriptures, and Jesus even once said, what thinkest thou? After he revealed some truth from the scriptures, he says, what thinkest thou? What are we supposed to think? Reason, right? Because the scriptures are reasonable. Even a child can understand the scriptures. We're not to get knowledge from the papacy, from his priests, who claim to be the sole possessors of the Holy Spirit and the sole interpreters of the Scripture, thus being consistent with their claim toward victor, vicar of Christ, as if it were God in the flesh, as if whenever the Pope speaks we are to hear God's voice, no, we are each indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And the papacy condemns us saying that we Protestants are all individual popes, thinking that we have within ourselves the ability to read and understand the scriptures through reason and not dogma. Okay? Now here is the Antichrist, Benedict the Sixteenth preaching reason. Okay, we're to use reason. This contradicts all of the history of the Roman Catholic Church. And this is why there are so many traditional Roman Catholics that have condemned every pope since Pope Pius XII. 
okay, a huge division in the Roman Catholic Church. These papacies, all the way from Pope, uh, <clears throat> from Pope Paul VI, all the way to the current Pope, are regarded by the traditionalists in the Roman Catholic Church as to be apostate, and some even claim that Freemasonry, which was was the power behind the French Revolution that that regarded the goddess of reason more than papal dogma, they suggest that Freemasonry has infiltrated the Roman Catholic Church, when in fact it's Jesuitry that has infiltrated the Roman Catholic Church, has taken over the papacy ever since Pope Clement the the Fourteenth. But I, if, if I go too much further, I might confuse people. But listen, just take it for granted. Just do your own research on this. Pope Benedict the Sixteenth preaching reason is contrary to the very fiber of the Roman Catholic Church. He's a liar. And what should we expect from the vicar of the liar? Okay. All right. In much the same way, beginning in the in the in the second part of uh, page one ninety five, he says, in much the same way that Pope John Paul II defined his papacy in a journey to Poland in nineteen seventy nine, Benedict committed one of the defining acts of his papacy during his homecoming. His own historic journey began on the afternoon of September 9, 2006, when Benedict flew to Munich to begin his six-day visit to the Bavarian region of Germany, where he had spent most of his childhood and his youth. Now, Bavaria was that portion of Germany that was always Roman Catholic. You know, the Protestants were in the north, Bavaria's in the south, and Bavaria was staunchly Roman Catholic. On Sunday, September 10th, the Pope gave an open-air mass to 250,000 people in Munich. The subject of his homily was, no surprise, the increased secularism of the West, a trend well documented in Germany, where regular Catholic mass attendance had fallen below 15%. Despite the large and exuberant crowds that met the Pope, Germany and much of Western society was becoming quote-unquote, deaf to God, admonished the Pope, and there was a great price to pay for this. Quote, when we bring people only knowledge, ability, technical competence, and tools, we bring them too little, unquote, Benedict told the crowd, picking up on the theme of Deus Caritas Est. <clears throat> now, why is this appropriate for Bavaria? Well, this is where we get the BMW, the Bavarian Motor Works vehicles, technologically advanced. Bavaria builds, Germany altogether builds, well, the highest technology components and parts and automobiles and everything. The Germans are just wonderful technicians. And they produce the most expensive cars the most expensive equipment because they are so detailed in their precision and their their technical abilities okay lacking the true faith they poured all their efforts into the into you know human endeavor okay there's most they are most successful in the human endeavor of production now he says, quote, we, when we bring people only knowledge, ability, technical competence, and tools, we bring them too little, unquote, Benedict told the crowd, picking up on the theme of Deus Caritas Est. As a boy in Nazi Germany, where he had been forced to join the Hitler Youth at 14, he had witnessed firsthand what the absence of God means what the absence of God can mean, sorry. Quote, All too quickly, the mechanisms of violence take over. The capacity to destroy and kill becomes dominant, unquote. While the, quote, scientific and technical prowess of the West, unquote, was admirable, a, quote, form of rationality which totally excludes God, unquote, is equally perilous. So the Pope is condemning the West, the Catholic West, of, of its lack of moral direction, its lack of Christian conscience, its lack of papal consideration. 
It has left the Roman Catholic Church. Attendance of Mass is only 15%. There's an almost overwhelming emphasis on production and technological advances and perfection in manufacturing and, and, and economic development that the Western world has become materialistic and must return to the faith. And according to the papacy, you know what faith that is, Roman Catholicism, worshiping, worshiping the creation more than the creator. Okay? The Pope's going to lead very out of, its, out of its materialism, and all the West, and that includes the United States, you must understand, out of its materialism and into a spiritual unity with the papacy. I mean, after all, that's what the Pope's got to preach if he's going to rule the whole world, isn't he? In the New World Order? If the Pope's going to have any defenders, he's got to regather his troops, doesn't he? Well, that's what he was doing. Now, Pope Benedict suggested another reason that Europe needed to recall its once fervent faith. Oh, by, by the way, you don't, you don't at all suspect that he's talking about Protestantism here, do you? No, 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 he's talking about the faith of Roman Catholicism which is diametrically counter to Protestantism. You can look at all of these words that Benedict says as part of the Jesuit-led counter-reformation in Europe. You see, the one great problem that the West suffered that the Pope's never mentioning here since Vatican Council II is that Protestantism nearly destroyed the papacy. Okay? So he can't condemn Protestantism <clears throat> without destroying his own ecumenical movement. So he couches his counter-reformation rhetoric into terms like, like materialism. Materialism is the enemy of the papacy and weakens the papacy. Okay, you see what's going on here? Never comes out and tells the truth, but the object of, of, of nearly every papal effort in this world is to destroy Bible-believing Protestantism. And why does the Pope you know, throw all of his effort to destroying Protestantism? Because it's the truth. That's why. Because Protestantism has already demonstrated that it relegated the papacy to the ash bins of history. And, the, and, and it's only because... Protestants have bought the futurist lie and thereby joined the ecumenical movement and now regard the papacy, strange as it may seem, uh, the, 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 the Christian leader of the world. Now the papacy is, re is, is fully prepared now to launch an all-out war on what remains of Protestantism in the world without ever even na naming it. Okay? All of this effort is designed to destroy once and for all the only threat on the earth that ever put the papacy on the ropes. Bible-believing Protestantism. That's the one thing that the papacy must fear more than anything else in Jerusalem, that Bible-believing Protestantism will get a foothold among the Jews and thus fully expose the papacy, because the Jews can do it. If they ever accept their Jewish Messiah, embrace the New Testament, understanding who their Lamb of God was, and they repent, and they walk away from their Jewish rabbis just the way I've walked away from my ecumenical evangelical belly pastors and stand on the written word of God, Rome is in big trouble. Bigger trouble than even the Protestant Reformation brought to it. So more than ever, we need to preach Christ and Him crucified. We need to preach that Jesus was the Lamb of God, that He fulfilled all the prophecies in the Old Testament, that He is the Jewish Messiah, and He came to deliver them first. And all they have to do is re repent of their anti-Christ. Stop looking for a future Christ, because the papacy's ready to give them one in Himself. And accept, and accept the historical Jesus so that when they do accept the historical Jesus that bore their sins on his, whole, his own body, 
they will fully recognize the counterfeit that the papacy is ready to launch upon them and that they'll patiently wait for that charade to finally run its course and wait, wait, wait for their true Messiah to return. I hope I'm making sense to my listeners. But until Christ returns, until the Pope can accomplish his future 70th week of Daniel, he must continue under whatever name he can foist upon it, the Counter-Reformation. If the Protestant Reformation ever receives ear in Jerusalem and in Israel, the papacy is toast. Avril Manhattan even stated in one of his books, Rome must coddle Israel, must control Israel, because if they don't, and the Jews ever come to the Christian truth, the papacy has lost all of its power. Okay? Now, Christians in Europe once came to the Protestant truth, truth, and the papacy lost all its power. But if the Jews ever come to the same truth that the Protestants came to, there's no, there's no hope for Rome anymore. Because maybe the Protestants will repent also and likewise of their ecumenical movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church and join their Jewish spiritual brethren in Israel. That's a force too strong for Rome. Okay? That's my hope. You know, the Jewish believers and the Christian believers, the European or the Gentile believers, all unite as one against the papacy, the counterfeit Christ. Do you hope, as, li as I do, that that's what Jesus has in store for his kingdom? I can't think of a better solution to the problem. Now he says, Pope Benedict suggested another reason that Europe needed to recall its once fervent faith. It might relate better to those who still had such a faith. Quote, the tolerance which we urgently need includes the fear of God, respect for what others hold sacred, unquote. Okay, do you understand what he's saying here? He's urging tolerance. Imagine the papacy urging tolerance upon the world. And that we need to fear God. <laughs> yes, indeed, we need to fear God. That is absolutely true. But from the Pope's mouth, what does that mean? You need to fear the papacy because he's the vicar of God. Right? And we must respect what others hold sacred. You know what? I wonder what Elijah would say to this Antichrist Pope that says we ought to respect what others hold sacred. Oh, I'd like to develop that one, but I'm fresh out of time and my voice is already beginning to crack. We'll just carry on where we left off tomorrow on the program. Thanks for listening. I hope the Holy Spirit descends and fills your mind with wonder. And the scriptures become more precious to you than ever after today's broadcast. In Jesus' name, I ask it. We'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update.